Thank you for joining our program today on creating systems for data sharing between schools and out-of-school program providers. This program is sponsored by the Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest, typically abbreviated as RHEL Midwest. RHEL Midwest is part of a network of 10 regional educational laboratories funded by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. RHEL Midwest helps educators and policymakers expand their knowledge and understanding of research and its value to decision making and education reform. We serve a seven state region including Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. RHEL Midwest is administered by the American Institutes for Research, a not-for-profit research organization. This event is part of our Making Connections series, which bring together researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to engage in a collaborative discussion on education issues. We're pleased to present this broadcast in partnership with WFYI. I would like to introduce our moderator for the day, Carol McElvain. Carol is a managing director at AIR. She currently directs AIR's expanded learning work, focusing on providing research-based, high-quality training, technical assistance, and professional development, and disseminating research results and policy reports. We're pleased to have Carol McElvain as part of our program today. Policymakers and practitioners in the Midwest region and around the country know that educational opportunities for students as they progress through school do not end when the school bell rings. By providing high quality programming and rich hands-on experience in a wide variety of connected educational, recreational, arts and service activities, students have the opportunity to build their skills and knowledge in a supportive environment, contributing to better attendance in school, lower reports of disciplinary incidents, and a better sense of future for themselves. However, given that there's a wide variety of activities and time devoted to out-of-school time activities across the country, the out-of-school time field, including partnering agencies and organizations and schools, are looking to better link their data systems together so they can more accurately describe shared outcomes in a more formalized fashion. Our panel today will discuss the background, benefits, and challenges of sharing data to bridge the after-school or out-of-school time community and the traditional school day together. I'm excited to introduce three individuals who will provide insight into these important issues. Debbie Zipes from the Indiana After School Network, Priscilla Little from the Wallace Foundation, and John Brandon from the Marion County Commission on Youth based in Indianapolis. The panelists today will discuss three topics, emerging trends in data sharing between schools and out of school time, the state of data sharing systems in districts and cities across the nation, and finally, local level approaches for implementing data sharing systems. First, let's start with Debbie. Debbie is the president of the Indiana After School Network, bringing with her more than 20 years of nonprofit leadership experience. Debbie's current work focuses on increasing youth access to high quality, affordable, out of school time programs that prepare them for success in school, work, college, and life. Debbie engages cross-sector partners at the national, state, and local levels to increase funding and resources, influence policy, and strengthen the quality of out-of-school time programs statewide. Debbie, I've already bantered around the idea of, of after-school programs and out-of-school time programs. Can you just start us off on the, on the right foot at the beginning to tell us what, it, what is the difference between the two and how are the terms defined? Great question, and we actually use those terms interchangeably. So we define out-of-school time as programs that take place beyond school hours. So it could be before school, after school, during the summers, weekends, evenings. And these are programs that are intentional about building on school day learning, enrichment, and supporting the academic learning for kids and really preparing them with skills to succeed in school and work and college and in life. And these programs can take place in a variety of, set a variety of settings. So maybe a school, a community center, a faith-based organization, a university. And, um, and we uh, actually have a video to show you what it looks like on the ground. We wanna thank the Arizona Center for After School Excellence for putting this together for us today. 
So, what does out of school time look like? Out of school time looks like learning how to build a robot, how to launch an own rocket, how to use Oreo cookies to learn about the moon. Out of school time looks like being active, getting better at my favorite sport, learning how to climb higher, run faster, throw further. It looks like finding out what I'm really good at, learning how to soar through the air, making and sharing my music with the world. Out of school time looks like getting smarter, raising my grades, and having fun. It looks like me making my parents, my teachers, and myself proud of all I'm accomplishing. Out of school time programs are really critical for kids all around the state of Indiana and around the country. And they do several things. One is they keep kids safe um, during the highest crime time hours after school. For those of you who don't know, all across the country, kids are most likely to either be a victim of a crime or commit a crime during the after school hours on weekdays when parents are working and kids are home alone. In Indiana, more than 300,000 kids, kindergarten through high school, are home alone, unsupervised during those after school hours. So after school and out of school time programs are really critical for keeping kids safe. They also are really key for inspiring learning and expanding the learning hours that kids can have. So if you actually add up the number of hours that kids can be in an after school and a summer program, it adds up to the same number of hours as 144 school days. So we have a tremendous opportunity to expand learning for kids. In fact, kids are only in school 20% of their waking hours and what they do during that 80% of their time can be a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, we know that around the country that affluent kids will have up to 6,000 more hours of enrichment and academic learning experiences by the time they hit eighth grade compared to their low income peers. So after school and summer programs are really key for really bridging that um, academic gap between the, the more affluent and the, the kids living in under-resourced communities. We also know that after school and summer programs really are critical for supporting working parents. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of data that shows that uh, productivity among working parents decreases uh, during the between 3 and 6 p.m. during the week if they don't have stable uh, places for their kids to be. So the, the um, out-of-school time programs are really um, an important part of the learning experience for kids all around the country. Thanks, that helps a lot <laughs> clarify things. Uh, next we'll go to Priscilla. Priscilla Little is the initiative manager at the Wallace Foundation, supporting its after school system building work. Prior to coming to Wallace, she was at the Harvard Family Research Project, where she led research teams to investigate policy relevant after school issues, such as improving participation, addressing program quality, building after school systems, and supporting expanded learning partnerships. Priscilla, your work is helping to identify and define how data can be used in out of school time per, per, for out of school time purposes. Can you provide us with some examples of data that's being collected and how it's being utilized? Sure, and, and I also want to say I'm really happy to be part of this group here today. There are several kinds of data that out-of-school time programs collect. First and foremost, an after-school program worth its salt should be collecting program attendance data. They should know who's participating when and for how much. Um, many many after-school programs also, or citywide programs, also collect program location and where services are offered so that we have a sense of across the community what are the opportunities for young people in the, in the city or the community. Um, some organizations collect crime data. You were talking about juvenile crime. It's really important. The, the horrifying statistic that I learned as my kids were aging into teenagers, it's the, also the peak hour for teen sex. So we really do want to get kids in out-of-school time programs. Um, we also see programs collecting program quality measures, very important. Lots of youth outcomes measures, including academic and social emotional outcomes. Programs collect and use this data in a number of ways. One way programs collect information is via a management information system, or an MIS. A recent Wallace commissioned report by the RAND Corporation, Hours of Opportunity, lists seven different ways that information collected through a management information system is used. First and foremost, to understand and improve programming and participation. And sometimes this is done through market research, where um, a researcher will help understand what, what parents and children's needs and wants are in a community. Um, data is also used to improve out-of-school time program contract management, to make funding decisions, 
to change the nature of contract management to really focus more on program quality and less on contract compliance. Um, data is used to improve coordination among programs and schools through data sharing. It's used to inform evaluations. And lastly, it's used to support requests for continued and additional funding. And let me just give you one real life example. The Providence After School Alliance puts its attendance data to work every day in order to organize transportation home from its programming. But it also uses attendance reports to follow up with students who were absent from the program and find out why, what's going on, why aren't you coming? And it also uses that same attendance data to track participation patterns to see which program offerings are getting the most or the least kids, and then they can adjust their programming accordingly. Thanks, Priscilla. And now, last but not least, John Brandon. Uh, John is the president of the Marion County Commission on Youth, and he has over 30 years of experience in the youth development field as a youth worker, counselor, caseworker, trainer, and agency executive. John is responsible for overall agency management, staff development, strategic planning, partnership and relationship building, and fund development. That's a lot on your plate. <laughs> uh, John, can you tell us what kind of, kinds of data you're seeing being collected at programs? Sure. I, I think it depends on who you talk to because people are collecting a wide variety of data. As Priscilla said and as Debbie said, a lot of data about numbers and you know, the things that we might often call quantitative data. How many young people are showing up to programs? Where are programs located? Uh, how, do, how do I get to those programs? And I think it's important for us to think about the why we collect data, and that's because the, the data gives us the reason to do what we do. And so if, if, we, if we know how many programs we have and how many young people aren't going to them, then we know how many more programs we need to, to satisfy the need in the community. The, the important piece of data is the, the qualitative data that we collect. We want to make sure that programs that serve young people in the out-of-school time hours are high quality that they're offering young people the experiences, uh, the supports that they need to develop the skills that are so important to life, that are, are reinforcing the academic lessons that take place during the, during the school day. And, and I think we also, importantly, we want to know what's the impact. We want to know the impact data. Is, is what's taking place in those programs or are the programs that those young people experiencing really making a difference in their lives? Are they changing things? Are they resulting in young people being more skilled, being more talented, being more ready, as, as Debbie has said, for, for life and, to, and for work? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Debbie, is there anything that you want to add to that? Well, just to uh, reference some of the, the data that we're collecting in the state of Indiana is one is we're mapping where are programs located ac across the state how many, just like um, John and Priscilla were talking about, how many kids are being served, what kinds of activities are taking place, where are the critical gaps in, in cities around the state. And it's actually not that easy to track that data because it moves and shifts constantly. Um, so in our database, we've actually merged it with the state child care database. So now parents can find programs uh, birth through high school and um, communities can use the data if they want to figure out where are the gaps, where should we target investment or action. Uh, we can use it when we meet with uh, policy leaders and, and trying to increase investment in out-of-school time. So having that kind of uh, data is, is really key. Um, we are also, as John was saying, uh, working on how do we support programs in, in strengthening quality around the state. And so one of the things that we did a few years ago is get a whole bunch of people around the table, experts in the field, to create the Indiana After School Standards. Uh, we have now since then created specialty standards in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, college and career readiness, so if programs really want to be intentional about preparing kids of all ages, K-12, for college and careers, what are the things that they need to, to know about? Uh, summer learning, how do they turn around summer learning loss in an in, in, in intentional way over the summers? And uh, we've now partnered with the State Alliance of YMCA's on um, standards for healthy eating and physical activity. So programs can actually, this is now all um, an online system. As we got a lot of support from the Indiana Department of Education and Chase Bank to automate all of this. So programs can create reports 
of where their gaps are, where their needs are, and then we can work with our partners around the state to provide professional development in the, the gap areas. And then just to build on what John and Priscilla were talking about, I think then the next level is to really track what is the impact on students. So students participating in these programs, and I would say the largest data set that we have in our state is related to the 21st Century Community Learning Center grants, mm -hmm. which is, we have about 250 programs funded by the Department of Ed, serving 20,000 kids. And one of the important data pieces that we've learned is that the youth uh, who are in programs 60 or more days, mm -hmm. that's when you start to see the, the needle move. Um, 30 or more days, you see a little bit of movement. Less than 30 days, you don't see much impact. So 60 or more days, you start to see increased grades, increased state test scores, increased attendance. So that's really important for us as we're looking at programming that we actually are keeping those kids consistently over time. Yeah, that's an enviable mm -hmm. system that mm -hmm. you've created. And, and as such, um, that's taken a lot of partnership building, I'm sure. Priscilla, in your work with school districts, districts across the country. What factors have you seen that are important to building partnerships between districts and out-of-school time providers? So my research and others as well um, indicates there are really four factors that are important when you want to take partnership work seriously between districts and schools. Uh, excuse me, districts and providers. Um, first, the districts and providers have to be on the same page about what their shared vision for learning is all about um, with an intentional and explicit contrast between what happens in the after school program and what happens in the school day. Mm -hmm. A second factor that, that research indicates is important is to really intentionally blend staffing. So you have role clarity, but you may have after school providers in the school day to be the critical liaison so they understand what the kids' school day experience has been like to bring into the after school. Similarly, we hear that um, Teachers really like working in after-school programs because they can experience and experiment with different ways of teaching, pedagogies as they might say, mm -hmm. so that they can really, you know, there's more project-based learning and opportunities to really experiment with teaching styles. So that's really important. Um, a third factor is communication, 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 and developing multi-level relationships. And what do I mean by that? Well, people will say, we need to cultivate relationships with everyone from the maintenance workers in this building all the way up to the superintendent, that those relationships have to be cultivated and maintained. Sometimes there's a designated hitter for that. You'll have mm -hmm. an after-school liaison. Sometimes not. Some, sometimes that job is housed within a family resource coordinator. But keeping your eye on the prize of communications is really important. Important. And, and then most relevant to the discussion here about creating systems um, around data sharing is we see that regular and reciprocal collection and sharing of information about student progress is really critical to the success of partnership work. Um, what I see is that after school programs usually know how students are faring in their programs. Not mm -hmm. always, but usually. But what we don't see too often is reciprocity where out-of-school time programs and school folks are sitting together mm -hmm. to look and talk about data. Um, and that's really what needs to happen. And access to a shared management information system certainly facilitates those kinds of conversations. And in building upon what Priscilla said, a lot of that has to do with learning to speak the same language. Mm -hmm. uh, after school providers speak, speak uh, youth development language, educators speak education language, and oftentimes those two languages don't, don't commute, the, the communication yeah. that you talked about is so important, but they're communicating sometimes with different languages. And so it, it becomes extremely important for, for staffs in both of those settings to learn the other, the other settings language. So that when they do exchange information, when they do talk data, when they talk about progress of young people, they can talk on the same level and understand where they connect. Because we know that a young person's growth and development requires that integration of both of those institutions working together. The yeah. school, the out of time, school time providers, and when they're working together well, we know that those programs are, are most effective. Youth workers want to support schools, and so it's, it becomes important for them to figure out how to be most effective in doing that. And I think, as Priscilla said, I think schools want to support youth workers, too. They want young people to be involved in out-of-school time programs because they realize the extended learning that takes place there, the enhancement learning that takes place there, the skill building that takes place there. And I think if we can tie all those pieces together, 
then we could substantially increase the likelihood that young people will do better and that both schools will be successful and out of school time programs will be as well. Yeah, once, once we get all the players together using the same language and data, no small uh, feat itself, how do we get them to agree on the goals of data sharing? Well, at the Wallace Foundation, we believe that the most successful way to unite all the actors around collecting the same data is through the development of city or community-wide out-of-school time systems, and that's the initiative that I'm managing currently at the foundation. A systems approach really knits together a network of providers and fosters collaboration on data and quality, both within the provider network, but increasingly also outside the network and with other collaboratives and, school, and the school district. Wallace has currently invested in 14 communities to build out of school time data systems, and we coupled those investments with research on how those communities were faring and how, how they were going about implementing a, a system. And what we saw is that data sharing is critical to improving program quality and access and really helping to understand where services are needed and target the kids who need it the most. When out-of-school time programs can get and use good data, it really helps them work, what we say, better and smarter to support student success. Um, what, but one of the first steps in getting stakeholders to agree to goals of data sharing is to ascertain the shared outcomes that schools and OS2 partners alike are looking to impact. These discussions should happen prior to any discussion about how to collect the data, such as specific indicators, management information systems. That's really important, and we will circle back to that probably two or three times in the next 45 minutes or so, because <laughs> there's all, we, we talk about the, the MIS tail wagging the data dog. Mm -hmm. you, know, we, you really have to figure out what your data strategy is, right. then figure out your MIS solution. Um, you also don't have to start with a management information system. Right. Sometimes communities start because they have a common question they want to ask, like how many students are on track to graduate? What are the supports available in the community to help students get and stay on track? This may lead you to very different data collection strategies, but at the end of the day, we do think that having a shared management information system is critical when you really want to cultivate school after school partnerships around learning. Debbie, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, sure. At, at the local level, one of the things that we're do, what we've learned as, as a state network is that you can really have the greatest impact at the local level. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've been doing is actually building on some of the Wallace learnings and um, creating um, after school or out of school time coalitions all around the state. And we've partnered with um, the Institute for Coalition Building out of Columbus, who've created this really well-developed model for how do you actually move toward collective impact. Mm -hmm. And we have taken that model in six communities around the state of Indiana. And what we are doing is pulling together the, the stakeholders that care about expanding learning beyond the school day. Mm -hmm. So the after school and summer program providers, the faith-based organizations, universities, museums, museums, libraries, uh, businesses who really want to be preparing kids with skills for their industries in that region. So we get all of those folks around the table. We figure out, as Priscilla was talking about, what is it that, what's the compelling question? What is it that they really care about? Um, how, what, is, what is the information that they want to find out? Yeah. What already exists? Mm -hmm. how do, and then they go and they actually gather the data, <laughs> um, create a picture. What, what does this look like and what do we want to do about it? Yeah. And, um, and then they create some um, strategies for, for actually moving the needle in the area that they want to. So our coalitions around the state are working on one of uh, four goals, which is either to, um, and pro most of them actually are doing all of them um, at, uh, in stages. So increase the investment at the local level in out of school time and the visibility of the power of out of school time. Mm -hmm. Um, the second is to increase youth access to programs. So what we're finding at the local level is that there may be actually enough program slots available for kids, but they can't get there. There's a transportation barrier or a cost barrier or parents don't know about the programs. So, um, so helping um, increase the, overcome whatever the, the local barriers are, um, strengthening the quality 
of uh, programs and, and helping to support staff development. And then the fourth is increasing out-of-school time connections to local education and workforce development initiatives and assets. So how are after-school and summer programs partnering with local businesses to build robots or to do cool, inspiring things beyond the school day? How are they using students in universities or experts in the, in the community to connect in and prepare kids for the future? That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anything that you want to add, John? In Indianapolis, we're fortunate to, to have a group of, of uh, summer program providers that have formed a professional learning community. Uh, these are programs that are, that are funded by our Summer Youth Program Fund, uh, supported by Marion University, and, and one of our key partners is the M.A. Rooney Foundation. And they serve as the data gatherer, the data analyzer, as well as the trainer of, of our program providers and program staff, helping them learn how to analyze, look at data, understand what it means, and, and using what they learn to change their practice so that they can help young people improve and grow because the whole goal behind it is to reduce summer learning loss right. by incorporating fun hands-on learning activities during the summertime and so that's been a, a great opportunity for us to work together with a lot of key partners and really gen, gen, both generating and utilizing data to help inform practice. Thanks John. We're going to switch gears a little bit now, and uh, right now we're going to talk about sort of the state of data sharing systems in districts and cities across the country. Um, you just gave some great examples of programs that are working to build their capacity. Can you give us a little more information about considerations that cities and districts who don't have such a great <laughs> system de develop, um, what they should think about when they're beginning to create a data sharing system? So, well, I think that um, along the lines of what John and Priscilla have already said, it's really key to figure out what it is that you want to move the needle on, um, mm -hmm. what is it that you care about, and so um, figuring out what that information is and then what data systems already exist, and then where do you go from there. Yeah, and this is one of those things where, mm -hmm. remember I said we were going to hit a few yeah. key points a lot of times? Mm -hmm. This is one of them. It's just really right. important that the data collects, that you collect matches the questions you want to answer. Too often, again, we see cities jump directly to data solution and make decisions about an MIS before they really even know what they want the data to do. Right. We really recommend that cities begin by getting all the relevant stakeholders together to ask, what do we want to learn about the experiences of students in this program? And then develop a data strategy that that will help you collect the information you need. Another point I'd make is that it's important to collect what, in research speak, we would call actionable data. And by that I mean is if you had the information, would you be able to use it to make change or improve what you're doing now? You know, I think a, a trap a lot of communities fall into is that they collect so much data, they don't know what's important. They, they talk about drowning in data. And so, so what's just noise is getting in the way of really understanding what they want to learn about. Right. I want to show a, a brief clip from Better Together, a conference hosted by the Wallace Foundation last year, where 57 <coughs> cities working to build after school systems came together to talk about the work and, and share ideas about what they were working on. One of the four strands at that conference was around data and data sharing. And so I have a few sound bites from some national experts who participated in that conference about data sharing. great place for a city to begin thinking about getting involved in after school or thinking about creating a system is first to assess the landscape of their community. Figure out what programs already exist. Where are those programs? Look at where the young people are. So first figuring out what do I have? You know, we have a lot of resources in our community. How do we get that information out to our parents so that they know what they have available to them? Data can then drill a little bit deeper to say, here are some groups of, of young people that maybe are at risk of dropping out, that aren't behaving in school, that have behavior problems. That is an, uh, a signal that after school can come in and provide tutoring, extra supports, uh, after school engagement, and programs like that. Well, that was great. It's great to get that the expert perspective on it, although you guys are experts too. But uh, but but we're really 
I, I'm really looking to see an example of a program that's experienced some positive outcomes um, from building a data management system. Uh, is there something that we can learn from them, Priscilla? Yeah, I'll start off and then I know you guys want to chime in. I mean, ideally I would talk about all nine cities in the initiative I'm managing, so I, at the risk of offending the other eight. Um, I, I'd just like to talk about Nashville, the Nashville Afterzone Alliance for a minute. They are a really great example of a city after school system that's put its data to work. It's a middle school after school program that serves um, kids across the city. And its data system is nested within Metro Nashville Public Schools data system. And this enables teachers and providers alike to see how students attending NASA programs are faring and what supports they need to do better. Um, they track participation as well as the key, what we call the ABC indicators, so attendance, behavior, mm -hmm. and courses, to really get a sense of how the kids in NASA programs are doing and then adjust programming accordingly. Principals and program staff meet regularly to look at data and just have learning meetings about what is the data telling us about the young people in the, these programs. They're now in the process of linking their management information system data directly to their program quality data so they can really get a much more robust picture of, of what programs are producing, what are, the, what are the quality features that are producing the highest outcomes for kids, and then be able to replicate those across not only NASA, but something the nation can learn from. Debbie, do you have an experience in Indiana? So one of the, the communities that we're working with where they are collecting a lot of information and data, and we've just been doing these out of school time coalitions for the last several months, so we're kind of new into the work. But in Columbus, what they have done is, is convened the providers around the table, um, used our mapping database to track where are the programs, how many kids are being served, where are the gaps. And um, it's just been really interesting looking at the data to actually make decisions. And so some of the information that's come to light is that there's a lot of uh, programs targeting elementary school kids. And then very hard to identify where the programs are for middle school kids mm -hmm. or they're very um, short term or skill focused. Mm -hmm. So a debate team or a sports team or things like that. So hard to find these kind of comprehensive programs for middle school kids. And um, this community in Columbus is a very STEM rich community. So lots of science, technology, engineering and math companies um, that have a strong presence. Um, but. We're, we're not seeing that translated into the out-of-school time world. So having those pieces of data has been really informative for us now to, to plan together on, all right, there are all these assets in, in our community. How do we pull them together to move the needle on, in these gap areas? For us, having, having the M.A. Rooney Foundation as a data partner has been extremely important because most out of school time programs aren't used to collecting data and when they do collect it they may not quite know what to do with it so having someone who who has the expertise as well as the agreements in order to collect the data to be able to put it together into into a dashboard or a report mm -hmm. that so uh, so that a program director in the youth program can read it and say hmm i know that we need to do some more work in terms mm -hmm. of reading or math or whatever it might be with this particular group of students or even this individual student has has really helped program directors know how to adjust their programs so they can genuinely meet the needs of the, of the young people who are walking through their doors. Yeah, I, I mean that raises the issue of accountability and quality. Um, it, it can be really difficult to create systems that connect that kind of data. Priscilla, you talked about people drowning in, in data, so, so it can be tough. But can you talk about the challenges of creating a data management system that also addresses questions related to program accountability? Sure, I'll go first and then you jump in. Okay. Um, I, yes, I can, but I, I have to say, I think you need to be really cautious about using data systems alone for accountability purposes. Uh, we talk about high stakes, low stakes, and and many data systems are really in the low stakes category of you use that information for program improvement. Um, while management information systems generate a lot of information in reports, it really takes a seasoned researcher to make sense of the full range of management information system and implementation data to make decisions about accountability. So I think the real value in a data sharing system alone is to learn what works for which kids under what circumstances. So I know I 
skirted the question slightly, <laughs> but I just I get very nervous about right. using data management information alone for accountability purposes. Being evaluated scares people mm -hmm. yeah. because it, it, it seems to have a sort of a punitive sort of uh, connotation to it that if you don't meet up to a certain standard, you're in trouble. And for most uh, out of school time program providers, what that means is you may lose your funding. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you don't have your funding, you can't serve young people. So I think as, as Priscilla said, it, it's important to make a, it, at least initially a sort of a low stakes exercise as well as a, as a process that provides supports to program managers to help them upgrade their quality and improve their practice. Uh, we use locally uh, the, the youth program quality assessment process, mm -hmm. which really helps uh, youth programs recognize the quality of what they're offering and then offers uh, supports to help build the skills of staff, which is really where the, where the work gets done, the relationship between the skills and the, between the staff members and the young people uh, as they walk through the door. And so, and we, I think the other important piece is that uh, it requires, as Priscilla alluded to that, a long-term commitment. Yeah. You, you can't make, your, make a decision about whether a program is good or bad based on one snapshot. Because right, yeah. maybe that was a bad day, right. either for right. the kids or for the, or the program staff. Right. So it's important right. to have the, the commitment to look at data, evaluative data over time to determine whether or not that program is really meeting its marks. Right. Well, and I think if we're if we're looking at how do we create a coordinated citywide data tracking system, mm -hmm. there's a lot of complexity to it. So mm -hmm. obviously, there's there's a lot of the the federal laws around what kind of information you can share related to students. So there's those barriers. Mm -hmm. There's also that programs all have their own individual systems, especially if it's like a Boys and Girls Club or a YMCA, they have a national system mm -hmm. that they're working with. And so how do all these systems talk to each other? Mm -hmm. And um, again, how do you overcome some of the challenges around consents and, um, or, and uh, programs serving kids with multiple school districts or school systems? So there, there is a lot of complexity to sharing the data. Yeah, there definitely mm -hmm. is. And there are regulations that you need to keep in mind too Mm -hmm. um, Priscilla, maybe you can tell us about uh, other challenges that uh, districts and cities should expect to encounter when they're building these systems. Yeah, and I'd like to build on the one challenge that, that Debbie mentioned, which is around developing data sharing agreements that enable sharing while respecting privacy issues. Um, some folks are familiar with the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, um, which really governs the confidentiality and permitted uses of educational records can't underscore the importance of knowing what that law is and abiding by it, um, because you can really get yourself into trouble if you don't have the, the, the right kind of data sharing. It's hard to do, it's hard to set up these agreements, but once they're there, they're there. Um, and it's really helpful for you to then get access to the data. Um, in the absence of more restrictive state statute, the law's provisions determine whether and with whom schools can share student information. FERPA applies to any recipient of funds from the U.S. Department of Education, so this includes local and state education agencies. It generally excludes private and parochial schools. After-school providers, city coordinating entities, and third-party program evaluators, essentially the folks we've just all said are collecting mm -hmm. all this data, all fall outside the list of organizations generally permitted to access student records by FERPA. That doesn't mean you can give up. And in fact, a recent report from the National League of Cities on management information systems offers some really helpful strategies. There are sort of three basic approaches that they talk about. You can partner with schools to conduct after-school evaluations. You can negotiate a, a, an agent of the schools to access student information. And most commonly, we see after-school programs requesting prior written permission from each student's parent or guardian to share academic information. And you can do that even as simple as to have a checkbox on your enrollment form that asks, do you give permission for this program to access student records? Um, an, another resource, if you're interested in learning more about data sharing, is the Wallace Foundation has a set of tip sheets um, and this picture is of one, the one on data sharing strategies. In that report, you'll find lots of concrete examples of the way out-of-school time programs have been successful in accessing school data. It talks about how they've overcome legal barriers, um, again, strategies for getting parent consent, talks about collecting student identification information when students enroll, 
Um, it's important to be clear about who can share the data and who gets to see what data. Sometimes providers don't need to see the full range of data, but your evaluator does, so being clear about who gets what. Um, in some cases, we've seen it helpful for communities to gauge in third-party researcher, like Rooney. We see in some of the cities I'm managing that they do have a third party who helps negotiate this. They then negotiate the privacy and become the repository of the data. Sometimes having that neutral partner is great, and universities are a great place to look to find that kind of neutral data partner. So in addition to data sharing, there's one other issue I'd like to flag. And, and that's even before you start working with schools to access data, it's important that your after-school provider community understands the value of collecting and using information because if you're not preventing a united front, united front to the school, that can really get you into trouble. Often folks are leery of data. They worry, as you said, they'll be judged, perhaps even defunded if their results aren't as good as other programs. So as you, need, as you set up your data system, you need to assure that at least initially, data will really be collected for program improvement. You're gonna look at participation patterns with the goal of improving attendance and program quality. Um, in evaluation speak, this is called a continuous improvement mindset, where providers really think that data is their friend. Yeah. <laughs> Just adding to what you're saying, Priscilla, I think that um, also looking at how we're looking at um, program improvement, but we're also looking at the individual student. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being able to have access to Billy's grades yeah. can really help the program help move the needle for that, help that child, that yeah. young person yeah. move forward. Yeah. So, um, I, and I think that you talked about there's some simple ways that programs can get consent forms. I know a lot of um, programs and communities that are working with their school districts so that it's actually part of the um, sign up in the beginning, on the first day of school, that's part of the regular school paperwork. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are some ways to make it happen and what's really key is that the school district and the youth programs are in partnership together trying to figure it out together. And I, and I think those, mm -hmm. those partners have to have a a willingness to address the challenges that arise when it comes to sharing data and find a solution instead of hiding behind regulation. You know, instead of saying, well, it's, it's easy for someone to say, well, that's a confidentiality issue or, right. or you're not entitled to that, rev that information because of FERPA, uh, doesn't mean the conversation has to stop there. But I think it means that the next question is, okay, then how, when can we sit down and discuss what type of helpful information might be available for you to share with us. Can we explore whether or not our understanding of that regulation is in fact true that's preventing you from giving me that? And just because maybe that is the reality, it doesn't mean we have to stop there because if regulations are getting in the way of us best serving children and youth, then we know what our next step is. You know, regulations can be changed. There is, there is policy and advocacy, I think, that then becomes important to address so that we can make sure that those rich partnerships between out-of-school time providers and schools can, can be operating with the best possible information. Yeah, I mean, there are challenges to it, but you guys have been through it to a certain extent, so uh, maybe you could share some of the lessons you've learned in, uh, in, in districts and cities that are, are working to implement data sharing systems? I mean, I actually don't know that I have more to add than what Priscilla and John are saying. I think that it really is about the people who get to make those decisions, mm -hmm. that have the influence over those decisions, if those people can be at the table together and have shared agreement on, on a goal that they care about, mm -hmm. um, then I think they can work through the barriers together. So it really is about um, people coming to the table and, and working together as a team. Yeah, and, and the Wallace mm -hmm. Foundation's RAND research that I referenced earlier actually has identified some factors that enabled or constrained providers' use of an MIS. So first was the, the user friendliness of the management information system itself. In that study, some providers reported that their city's MIS was just difficult. It mm -hmm. had too many screens, mm -hmm. um, they crashed and lost information. So if you're gonna impose a data management system on your provider and school district community, make sure it's a good one. Make sure it's a, it really, you You've got the kinks worked out, you pilot it before you take it to scale. Um, a second finding from that report is that staffing and resources can be an enabler and a constraint. I mean, as we know, there's frequent staff turnover in the after school and youth workforce. And so that means continually training and retraining on how to 
enter data, and enter data that's quality. I mean, garbage in, garbage out. So if you're not going to get good quality data going in, there's really no point in analyzing it on the other end. And that's really a challenge for many providers. Um, a related point I see in the current Wallace System Building Initiative is really a lack of capacity at both the out-of-school time and district levels to make sense of the data they're collecting. We see communities have very robust data systems, but no capacity to make sense. And this speaks to the need to couple data collection efforts with training to make sense of what's being collected. Um, one example that we see that really has promise is in St. Paul, their system is called Sprockets. And in partnership with St. Paul Public Schools and the Wilder Foundation, which is their third party research partner, they've developed a training for providers called Making Meaning with Multiple Data Sets. It's helping providers make sense of four sets of data. So we're not just talking about participation and mm -hmm. outcomes. They're looking at their program quality data, their youth program experience data, their youth outcomes data, and their participation data and they're being trained to examine all four sets of information simultaneously in order to get a really robust picture of what after-school programming across the country, look, across that city looks like, and then make informed decisions about where to invest. And two other points that we've touched on but are worth repeating, I mean, be thoughtful about those privacy issues and address them early. They are not an afterthought, they're a forethought. Um, and, and the second is get the district to the table at the outset. Don't bring them in later after you've already started working on things. They need to be a partner from the beginning. And I might add, we, we make this all sound so easy, that's why we're experts. We're supposed <laughs> to make something like that. But I think the key thing is, is, is not to give up because yeah. everybody up here can tell you that sometimes this is a frustrating process. Yeah. It takes more time than you want it to take. Uh, but so you have to kind of keep pushing and keep pushing. And, and sometimes it just ho helps to be able to point to those sort of successful yeah, examples, right, yeah. like Priscilla just said, because we can say, look, this city's doing it, yeah. and, and, and it's working out very well for them, so maybe we should be able to do that here as well. Are there any differences between data systems for different kinds of out-of-school time programs, like an, an after-school program versus a summer program? Yeah, I think a lot of that is context-based. So um, in the work that I've been doing with the, the Wallace Cities and then also in the National League of Cities report I referenced earlier, you can get more information on the approaches cities are taking, but we see four basic approaches to developing a management information system. Um, <clears throat> many communities purchase an off-the-shelf tool, and there are certainly a lot of commercial vendors out there that are happy to work with you to take their tool and customize it to your needs. Um, some of those are actually profiled in the National League of Cities report. Um, some initiatives, like Nashville, is, are nesting their data system, their out-of-school time data system, within another system pretty frequently. It's their public schools data system. Um, a, th a third way is to build your own. Um, and so, so figure out what your providers are, are need, and then Denver is an example of this, where they started from scratch. They engaged a software developer, told them what they needed, and the software developer has built it. Um, an, another approach that we see increasingly taking hold is to build what some people would call a data warehouse, where you realize, mm -hmm. and Grand Rapids is a good example of this, their expanded learning opportunities network actually th was thinking about using a commercial vendor, and then they looked around and they talked to providers and they surveyed providers and they realized people are already collecting a lot of data. And so they built a data warehouse where it will actually export the key variables that everyone in the city wants to know about into their warehouse. So they're mm -hmm. looking at juvenile crime, they're looking at student outcomes, they're looking at participation, and providers don't have the additional burden of yet another management information system that they're going to have to enter data into. So they've winnowed down. So they've, mm -hmm. ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so again, starting where, I, you know, concluding where I started, there is not one size fits all. And I don't know that summer, after school, those are the con contextual features. It's, it's more what's already happening in your provider community. I think schools have a, have a more robust capacity as well as a more robust responsibility for data collection and analysis compared to most out-of-school time programs. So, so many out-of-school time programs end up collecting the data in response to what a, what a funder is asking them to report, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in, in, less, in less in terms of how they're managing the content of what they're doing. I think the other issue that, that often comes to the forefront is that uh, 
uh, out of school time program providers are, are youth development professionals, they're not educators. And so I go back to the, as we talked about earlier, the communication and learning the language mm -hmm. of the education system and being able to interpret data. The disadvantage I think youth development folks have is that the things that they work on, the skill development, like self-esteem and awareness and communications and leadership skills and conflict resolution and time management and et cetera, how do you measure those? Mm -hmm. Those are much more difficult to measure. You can see it as a youth worker because you can see where Dewan moved from point A yeah. to point yeah. Z in a year's period of time, but, but how do you use a, a, a number yeah. to, to show that progress? And so yeah. I, I think there's a, there are two different types of data that we're looking to, to gather, but two yeah. which, both types which are very important. And I think um, adding to what John's saying, I think one of the, the challenges in, in the youth development field is what should we be held accountable for? Should we be held accountable for student um, achievement in school and grades and state mm -hmm. test scores? Is that really what we're about? Um, even though the, that's what the funding community sometimes is asking for, that's what corporations or others that want to invest want to see. But I think it's a, it's a really valid question in terms of um, what should we be held accountable for? Right. Mm -hmm. And before Debbie, you talked about um, getting the right people on board and, and getting everyone together um, and key leaders in particular. Mm -hmm. um, it can, can any of you tell about how you've gone about or you've seen cities go about uh, identifying the right people to get at the table? So um, in the different, no, that's a great question. I mean, in the different communities that we're working with, it, the approach has been, it, there's been a, a different door for each one. So um, I mentioned um, Columbus, the door was that the person chairing our STEM, our Science, Technology, Engineering, Math Committee, um, and we were focused on expanding STEM all around the state, and we raised all these dollars and we expanded STEM around the state, but none of the programs were happening in that region. <laughs> And so he, that, that group um, was able to bring together their local um, community foundation, which had a lot of connection to local industry, mm -hmm. to, to be the convener of these after-school providers. So that's one angle. In other communities, the providers themselves have been the, the place to start. Um, in other communities, it's been, we already had relationships with some critical mm -hmm. partners with universities and youth programs, and they asked us to, to come to the table. So, um, every community is different in terms of where the, the, the low-hanging fruit is, like who, who is already cares about this work and who has the influence. Uh, one of the questions is um, if you know that you have the right people around the table, is if those people around your table make a decision, something happens. Yeah. Then you know you have the right people. John, can you briefly describe uh, the, the kinds of people you've gotten together in order to... I think we've tried to look at the folks who are really engaged in enhancing the quality and the, and the strength of their program. There are folks who recognize that uh, with a little bit more support, with a little more guidance, maybe with a little more information, they would be able to have a greater impact uh, among the young people that they serve. Uh, again, we've been in our community, we're fortunate to have a, a, a group of local funders who also made uh, the incorporation of, of intentional learning activities during the summer space an important issue. They didn't mandate it to those that they gave dollars to, but they, but they said this is really important. Here's the research that shows that, and we're willing to, to invest a little more dollars into those who are willing to figure out ways to make that part of their summer offering. So I think it's, it's a, again, as Debbie said, I think it's, it's looking at the context, what's the issue that sort of the hot button issue that, that will get people excited that they can gather around because, again, we live in a, uh, a society that likes to see instant results, even though we know that this isn't about instant results, but it's over long-term development. But if we can help people say, yeah, I did that, and it made a difference, then they're more likely to keep coming back. 
Well, I can't believe our time is up already. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's been a great discussion. It's a it's complicated subject, but uh, your various perspectives have brought some clarity, at least to me. Um, and I want to thank you all for participating. And it's really great to have um, these different perspectives on research policy practice on the issue of data sharing between out of school time and the, and the traditional school day with the whole point of it being to better serve the young people in our country. So uh, with that, I will wrap it up for the day. And, um, and thanks again. You. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. <laughs>